Boom. All right. Let us start this closing session about the cooperation to f strengthen the data protection. Now that we're starting the session, perhaps people who are still in the coffee break are going to start uh, to understand that the session has started and coming in. So I'm going to use these two minutes that people are still arriving to uh, introduce our speakers. We are going to start on the right side, on the left side with Hermino, who is the uh, Andes professor and superintendent of data protection in Colombia. Elsa Main, she is the president of the Comet Committee of Convention 68 in Europe Council and with the Treaty of International Data Protection. Then we have Jonathan Mendoza, who is the Secretary of Data Protection and had access to the information in Mexico. Celaraña, who is the Secretary of Digital Topics in the Ministry of Justice in Brazil. I know that everybody knows uh, Laura Mendes. She's a professor of ITP and director of the CGSTDP and also one of our s founding souls of CPTP. Abetrez Antarelma, who is director of the Argentine Agency of Data Protection and Access to Information, and Marcelo Martinez, director of the digital unit of Itamaraty, which is the Re International Relations uh, Brazilian Ministry. And then last but not least, as we say, we have Virginia Powell, member of the EGESIC board, which is the authority from Uruguay about data protection. As you can see by the composition of this table, this last session here about the cooperation is about the objective to debate the cooperation, whether it's at a multilateral level, international level, but also multi-sectorial level. Uh, this is something that I'd like to highlight that when we think about this cooperation, it's always nice to think that not necessarily to dimension purely institutional, but also there is a multi-stakeholder and multi-sectorial dimension. And this is something that I would like to, you know, foster uh, the thought because Danilo taught us, this is a legacy that Danilo left for us, for the idea of always being open to dialogue and multi-sectorial dialogue with different players that work in different sectors and with different opinions as well. This is the most important part. We learn a lot more talking with people that are different from us than to always talking to the same people that always have the same opinion as us. This is very important. I think one of the great uh, successes of this is to have created this Latin American environment with people with very different backgrounds and nationalities and sectors, ideas, opinions, etc., to build things together. And, you know, in my opinion, one of the most important things in the cooperation for data protection in the scope of this multi-sectorial uh, cooperation is how to encompass different uh, and different players from different countries to create a data governance that is sustainable for everybody. I'd like to highlight two points that were very relevant, I think, in the last two days. Firstly, the s different stakeholders are not only useful to have an open dialogue as we have uh, tried to do here. So for example, to, to make that effort to create public policies and regulation to improve quality with feedback and input from different players, but also the, the implementation is important. Today we were talking ab about the Indian example. We can It's not necessarily in Latin America, but we can look at other examples for uh, inspiration. It's interesting to see how they implement things that the data governance do to with different multi-sectorial many partnerships. They work with the developers and the private sector, and together they developed innovative solutions that 
data empowerment and protection architecture, which was that mechanism of controlling uh, consent through software. This is extremely innovative and was developed due to a multi-stakeholder partnership. So it's very good to think that stakeholders are not only useful to give ideas, but also to help implement them. And in the, in the scope of international transfers, there's a lot of work that can be done, even as GPD also suggests to, to create partnerships with the private sector, the contractual uh, clauses, specific things, the con codes of conduct and everything else and the standard uh, global norms, these are all instruments that are elaborated by the private sector and then evaluated by authorities. They are regulated later. This is a dynamic that could work very well for this. And also, there's also innovation and cooperation, and I think we're going to discuss this. The clauses proposed uh, by the Ibero-American uh, network, this is very interesting as an institution, as a group, for an innovation or, or at least uh, a sui generis group geographically uh, ibero-america is uh, doesn't exist except on, on colonialism books but you know it's a very interesting thing to see how different authorities might be able to cooperate and come up with a single concrete proposal with clauses that are standardized and that facilitate uh, all latin american data traffic and uh, I'll send the, the word over the floor over to Lara and then we can start with our l speakers. Thank you, Luca. I'd like to congratulate the event, this magnificent event that you are able to gather so many stakeholders. And it's s very important to say that this is a dialogue uh, event. It's Danilo, and I'd like to make uh, pay res my respects to him that certainly dialogue was was his what he stood for this intentional intersectorial di dialogue and i think that this certainly is uh, at the heart of the ct cpdp this regional dialogue that's so important to us and now going directly into the topic i think is very important to have this final panel where we have so many institutions, so many authorities or people who have been part of authorities in Latin America. And this institutional dimension of data protection is very relevant. It comes to place when we think about rights and principles. There is no data protection without having an institutional dimension. It's almost as if we came from the assumption that these rights would never be able to be put in place without an institution behind it. And not only just an institution, but an institution that is cooperative, whether it's internationally or nationally with other institutions. I think this is a very important dimension. And it's very interesting to close this important event with this institutional and cooperation demand. I'd like to call our last Nelson Hemolina, our first panelist, Dr. Nelson. It would be interesting for you to be able to tell us about your experience, whether it is as an authority, being, having been the, the data protection superintendent, about this cooperation between countries and also how you see the international data transfer if the mechanisms that we have today are effective or if they could be improved. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. Luca, thank you for organizing this event. I think really this is it. everything is excellent. Now obviously I'd like to pay my respects to Danilo Donea as well. Um, we study a lot of things during life and obviously at the end we have only family and friends and it's a sad thing when friends leave earlier like Danilo did and uh, I discussed a topic with him that brought us here today which is the uh, cyberspace protection of human d data and I th I'd like to talk about four points number one the cooperation as a tool to face global challenges and global risks. That's the reality. 
Number two is reality. Three is to propose the international collection of data. And number four is to leave the strategies of the Ibero-American Network of Protection of Data. First of all, let's talk about cooperation then. From a long time ago, it has always been a tool to face global threats. We have been in a society that is permeated with technology and cyberspace. Almost 70% of the world population have access to the internet. This has changed uh, from in the last 25, 25 years. And uh, internet has changed the world. And the world has also changed facing internet, especially when you talk about the, the legal systems, if they have, uh, if the academia and the governments and everybody else have answers to the challenges that are proposed by the cyberspace. And I'd like to, to discuss this purpose of cooperation to say that is if this cooperation is a tool that is working in practice or not. So if we have problems that are global, well, let's cooperate to try to find a global solution. However, practice shows that this is not the way it works. There's, in theory, it, sh it works, but in practice it doesn't. And I'd like to reference now specifically what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd like to mention a news report from 2020 where the General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, had, uh, I'm going to read what he said. He said, the pandemic of COVID-19 has left uh, 700 million people infected who had COVID at some point and 7 million people who passed away all over the world. So reflecting in 2020, he was saying the following. The pandemic of COVID-19 is a crisis among other global threats which has put into test the international cooperation, a test where we have failed a lot. The scales reached by COVID-19 is the result of a lack of preparation, cooperation, unity, and uh, basically generosity, global generosity, especially this is about um, a data is the same thing. Are we prepared? Do we have uh, global solidarity? Is It's very important to become practice because in theory it works fine, but in practice it doesn't. And he finishes saying, this pandemic is a call of for attention that so that disasters more serious disasters that could happen especially with the climate crisis if we respond with this lack of union and this organization that we have witnessed this year i fear for the worst and that's how uh he says that if we don't act as a team uh, with these global phenomena we're not going to have results we will continue to fail in all topics this is not new. We have been doing important works, but among other things, let me continue to mention Dr. Anna Bryan from the United Nations. I don't know if you saw the study that she published where she talked about the elim elimination, elimination and accountability phenomenon from the public uh, entities during the pandemics. And then you can see the studies that were done where they compared 20 countries and what they did. And in conclusion, we can say that 20 countries promise things and enunciate things, but they also don't do them in practice. So we have to kind of lower data protection and sort of land it into the practical zone. And this is the greatest challenge that we have. The effective du protection to direct to human rights is the great greatest challenge we'll face in this, this century. And in our data we work about the data being circulating but our data are, are already out there everybody has it either it's public entities or public private entities and here's what I, I'd like to, to name to you I wrote an article called about the company internet which is an explanation of the right protection of in the 21st century in the internet of the companies people thought that the it's the internet that the companies use and it's not what it was all about it was called about the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Companies is something that I wish to explain how the rights, the human rights of people are defined in practice and ensured in practice, not only the public entities, but yes, the companies. All of these 
polities and privacy policies that they define and that we read or we don't read but we accept massively the terms of service and facebook for example had uh 1.6 billion users and now they have 3.3 billion users in the world so we have these companies all over the world all over the world collecting pe data from people all over the world and what are we doing when something happens with that company or any other company who holds so much data how is civil society responding and the authorities and the, the legal systems in the world how are they responding because basically a good part of our world is designed with legal territorial systems with authorities that have territorial competence uh, but nowadays basically for a long time everything is without borders right and one of the things that the the world is divided uh territorially but it's fused technologically we have to rethink this and to close we need to rethink and act more than rethink because we say a lot but we don't sometimes do a lot and there's a lot to be done so i'd also like to also close with this to talk about the international international data collection and cooperation so it's a little bit more about what i've been telling you that to collect cities uh, citizens data of in any of the countries that we are representing here today is not necessary for the companies that to be physically in the country if we continue working with norms for data protection or in any other subject that are applied and if the authorities are physically in that country we are not doing anything facing the socio-technological reality of this century what we are doing there is basically redacting norms that will not help us resolve real challenges so we need to rethink this and i think there is a huge asymmetry in this so public and private entities of many countries collecting data from people all over the world and if these people from different parts of the world if you ask them they say you know what i'm sorry uh, i'm not in your country this law does not apply to me so i've been in different events with authorities speaking about data protection and there is something really complex which is okay how do i notify a company that is not in colombia these are modern companies and technological aspects, but they use classical arguments so they are not notified because they don't want to hear it when we're speaking about violations of data or anything like that. They don't want to receive any kind of notification. So these things sometimes in practice do not let the authorities act because all authorities have or did have well, we need to act according to the law. So we need to revise our legal systems because technology has opened up this door for companies to collect data from citizens. But of course, everyone needs to do their part. So I want to finish up. The uh, data protection has really been thinking about different strategies and the most important one has to do with 2021 to 2025 4.1 and 4.2 these two points and my colleague jonathan knows these points very well says that the authorities of this network which are working together should be looking at cases that can impact many citizens from different countries in latin america and looking at their different competences when dealing with these situations. So if we look at cases, we need to understand if these cases happening in other regions are affecting our region. So for example, a cyber attack that happens in the UK can obtain information from citizens from other countries. So at that moment, the authorities should be asking themselves what has happened so they need to start acting and not just wait for somebody to complain. So we have 94 different data authorities throughout the world today. So if all of them act when this kind of situation happens, I think things will change. I hope they improve, but I think we have a lot of work to do. Okay, I think I've gone over my time. Thank you very much.
All right. Well, thank you so much, Nelson. I think it's really interesting, this perspective of understanding the complexity and the needs behind cooperation. And when we look at the flow of data in digital technologies, I think this can be compared to the pandemic in the sense that it really needs to be approached internationally. So it's very difficult, even impossible, actually we know it's impossible to regulate, for example, a pandemic without a cooperative approach. And in the same way, we need to stop being naive and think that we can regulate data protection with national approaches. So most countries perhaps that do not have the importance of bigger countries and more developed countries, they need this cooperation. Now, we will move to our next speaker of this session, Beatriz Anchorena who is the director of the Argentine agency. She has some experience in this area and regarding the benefits and limits of cooperation. And it's interesting to hear her opinion because Argentina at this time, I don't know if you know this, they're basically rebuilding their regulatory framework with a proposal. And I think there, that she can share interesting ideas with us all and maybe inspire us. All right, can you hear me well? Okay. Thank you, Luca, for inviting me here. I think it's really interesting to have these conversations and these conversations we've had over the past few days. And as Luca said, you know, we're having these conversations with diverse actors, as we can see on this panel. But here, I want to bring the government's perspective, the perspective of the data protection authorities, in my case, Argentina. But I think it's important for us to reflect about the government's role in this issue. And I think it's also important to think about Latin American countries and their governments and how we do need to build capacities on a government level and normative capacities so we can deal with the protection of personal data and deal with the conflicts that are produced through this issue which really crosses all levels of public policies. So countries like ours really need to have a strategic approach and I think it's essential to be efficient so in this sense, I also think it's very important when we think about public policies, something that was said in the introduction, you know, the stakeholders, for example, how do we work on public policies, both in the design and implementation? And here, I think it's also very important to have this dialogue with all of the actors in civil society, in the business world, the academic world. but considering that the government is not just any other stakeholder. They are making decisions, thinking about the common good. They receive all of the opinions and then can make a decision to defend the rights of the citizens of that country. So in this sense, I want to tell you about Argentina's trajectory in data protection and tell you about the bill that on June 30th was sent to Congress by our president. So this is a bill that is more than 20 years old. We were the first country in Latin America to have a law on data protection in the year 2000. So we had the European Union's adequation in 2003 and have a very important trajectory in this subject. So considering the technological transformations and the need to harmonize with international standards to be able to guarantee rights, we have decided to update our norms because when we speak about government capacities, we want concrete instruments that are given to us by democracy, by Congress, through legislations. That is why it's so important for us to promote this modern and updated legislation so the Argentine government 
can protect the rights of its citizens. So considering this idea, I started at the Agency of Access to Information that is linked to that of data protection and I started there three months ago. I can say we have started a project to update our norms and are conducting dialogues with all sectors, with businesses, civil society organizations, professionals that are experts in the area, public organizations, international organizations. So we have this open consultancy process and we are improving these different articles in the bill through this process. And I also want to pay a small tribute to Danilo, who was in the kickoff of this bill in Argentina on August 30th of last year. I met him there. And uh, of course, I was very sad to hear that he passed away. And I just want to acknowledge his amazing trajectory in this field and all of the contributions that he made to the Argentine project, of course. So from then on, we started the final version of this project that was sent to Congress on June 30th. And Argentina has also ratified the 180 plus convention. Uh, Elsa will talk to us about this, of course. This also gives us a robustness to be able to speak about the normative update that Argentina needs. Argentina, of course, continues working with protocols. We have updated the category on sensitive data and are working on, for example, international transfers. Argentina, since 2016, has two clauses for international data transfers. And these clauses, of course, need to be worked on, but we already have a trajectory in this issue and we will be working on these contractual clauses that the Ibero-American Network on Data Protection has elaborated. And all of this, of course, is linked to this regional organization. Now, thinking about cooperation, which is the central subject of this panel, cooperation, thinking about the 108 convention, and Argentina is participating actively with the European framework, the Ibero-American framework, Argentina is part of the executive committee, and we have had permanent conversations with the authorities of the region, so I think this is key as well to be able to build these government capacities so that they can also be regional capacities and we can think of our own models for development and as has been said in this event, we need to think of a model for data protection for this region and of course it's a very interesting challenge and I think we can achieve this goal. Of course, cooperation at an international level in GPA and the Global Privacy Assembly, Argentina is part of the executive committee and we are leaders in the Strategic Direction Committee. This committee creates the strategic plan of the organization and in October of this year we will be presenting a new strategic plan. It has already been elaborated and cooperation is a very strong point in it as well as capacity building for authorities and um, there are different rules and instruments mentioned in it as well. I think that Latin America has a lot to contribute in this sense and uh, can exchange many ideas with other actors, other regions. I think it really is a very interesting area for us to consider data protection as something cross-cutting in public policies and think of a path for a better quality of life for everyone. So the purpose of what we do is related to how we can improve the quality of life of the inhabitants of different countries. And I also want to mention, I'm sure Itamarati will mention this as well, but we are 
thinking about cooperation in the Mercosur, working with personal data protection in a specific working group here. And so these different countries can have different instruments, different ways of thinking on how to protect these human rights. So I just want to greet you all on behalf of Argentina. We love being a part of this conversation. We want to contribute to it. And I think we do have an interesting trajectory to be able to share experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Beatrice. This is a very interesting talk. I think it's very important to hear how uh, you recently evolved from a country which was a pioneer in Latin America and this theme. So I think it's very interesting in the recent activities that you have done uh, of cooperating. And I think that Brazil and all countries have a lot to gain with more cooperations and more dialogues with Argentina. And I think it's very important to have these conversations getting back together in the, Mer in the entire South American area. Now I'd like to invite our next panelist, Jonathan Mendoza, Secretary of Data Protection of the Mexican Authority of Data Protection. And we'd like to hear a little bit more if you could share of uh, the recent experience in Mexico, specifically for the cooperation area. And if you could give us uh, concrete examples, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure and a great responsibility to be here. Thank you, Luca. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be here from the first edition, and we've, we're here in the third, and I see that we've grown a little bit through this forum, and I think that I say very honestly, I think that to cooperate, we require one thing, and Doctor has already said, will the will to cooperate. We can all have great ideas. A lot of people do. But to make these ideas come to life, it's a very small group of people that can do it. And I think this is a great effective cooperation space for Latin America, from Latin America. And that has been evolving, just like another sentence of the General Secretary of UNO, Antonio Guterres, said, the technology at the service of humanity not humanity at the service of technology. How do we change this role and how do, do we from the authorities become a part of a conversation? Whether the ecosystem has to adapt to authorities or do the authorities have to adapt to the ecosystem? That's the question because the technology and evolution and the uh, innovation is consistent, instantaneous and is non-stop. And there's a sentence by Martin Buxton, an economist of health who I like a lot, and he says, "There's, it always seemed too ready to evaluate a technology until it's too late, until it's already permeating society and there's no other way to change the previous uh, regulations which would allow you not to obstruct necessarily or prohibit the technology but limit it to ensure fundamental liberties and rights. And I think that this is a room for, s for discussion. This discussion needs to be multi-stakeholder, multi-stakedisciplinary, but also transversal. Which means when we generate norms or regulations, we have to keep into account all the op opinions of uh, industry, academia, authorities in a space of dialogue that everybody has the same level that the authorities will be the ones that will implement because it's part of the state's uh, role but the open parliament system about uh, designing regulation especially when it's talked to, to technology is very ind it's indispensable for these uh, successful regulations uh, if they can't be correctly implemented they they're worthless uh, like Nelson said in the Anna Bryant's report where she said Bun Shu Han says, the me temporal measures have the bad habit of becoming definitive measures, which means they re they got the personal data for a s health emergency, and now how are they going to keep it? And what's our role in as authorities in the system? Another reference, divisions 
the extremist visions or radical visions that I've heard from Latin America to Latin America is something that I also learned from him when he uh, he was his, the superintendent. I'm not uh, involving you in my program. Please do not take it like that. But what I say is that Latin America is already in a mature stage. Beatrice was saying about the first regulation and data and personal data from the year 2000 that was 23 years ago and there are several countries that at the time did not have any regulations some countries had regulations only as complementary to the access of information and some of them didn't have a constitutional basis for this a fundamental right and human right in a great part of our region and now it's different now i think that we already have to start thinking in the take in taking the next steps to consolidate a culture for personal protection uh personal data protection and socialize uh, law because you cannot exert a law that you don't know and this inequality system where we can talk about the the digital services and the have uh, global corporate strategies I think that we can go uh, we can understand in a very easy way we have to seek easy solutions with private public part of part private partnerships with clear rules we all want to step 100, but to get to step 100, we have to take step one. So the first international cooperation focused on the region, I think, has to take experiences from other places, and Europe has always been a reference in that sense, because this is a consolidated right that has been for the last 50 years in that society. So the first regulation is from the 70s at that time in Europe, but is to take that and do what everybody says which is customized adapted to our reality here our social political economical and cultural reality and these tools are very useful this is a question that i that I was asked in a panel where i i spoke and i couldn't uh, answer the question is it okay to look at the tools in other places the toolkit for that's a tra data transfers for the supervisors is great to use it to make transfers from Brazil to other countries, I think it's dangerous because this is a tool that was designed for that region with their maturity level, legal maturity that they have in Europe. Uh, it's not to look at, not look at it, but to, to build contractual clauses in the Iberoamerican american Network of Protection of Personal Data. Pablo Palassi, who is the, the Regent has revised all the contracts that from ASEAN what was been doing in Europe was been doing in the consultative community. Yes, but he adapted that to a, a, a European reality or Ibero-American reality, which is a f with a focus on Latin America for it to be a useful tool, and they have been adopted by a couple of countries. But we Argentina has almost. Uh, trying to do this as Beatrice and other countries are kind of going in the on the process Mexico is also thinking about it I don't know if Uruguay has already done it yes they have and so it's a very effective cooperation mechanism cooperation is for the enforcement themes obviously why because we start a, a coactive uh, procedure for the realization of a right duty we we are already doing because it has been violated in the first place it has to be done but the role of the authorities for personal data protection is not focused on the coactive uh, is the preventive to build ecosystems of data personal data governance considering all of the things that are involved in this not only privacy but also digital ethics uh, security cybersecurity in human rights as well in these ecosystems we have these digital environments call it digital law call it to human rights and folks to the internet i don't know how you want to call it doesn't matter but these rights that we have uh in our constitutions they need to be also applied in the digital environment and now i can't pass the word now to, to Secretary Moema, but I'd like to conclude with this. Ibero-America has fixed the basis. Latin America has key positions in the international organizations that he exist here in this moment. Beatriz was saying the GPA plan is led, led by Argentina. 
Mexico is now a chair of GPA. The Ibero-American network is presided by Mexico as well. There's We have Uruguayans in the com consultative committee. We are in the international forums everywhere, which allow us to do this effective cooperation with a focus towards Latin America. So let us use all these voices. International cooperation is not a group of authorities, from my point of view, talking about these topics. It's a group of people specialized in the topics from different perspectives opining about teams to be able to seek solution that is balanced uh, and also functional. I think that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent talk. Uh, I think this is a point that you, there is a convergence here is the need to explore further the Lat Latin American potential uh, in a way of realizing that we are a very strategic geopolitical region. And it would be kind of stupid not to explore this occasion that doesn't come to our region as frequently. So we have become geopolitically strategic. And I think that this is a good moment to think about converging in terms of institutions and normatives, as we are trying to do with these studies that we mentioned yesterday, to propose and not just to diagnose what we have, but also be propose, uh, proposing ideas. And talking about this, I'd like to hear the ideas of our participants here. You see that there is a QR code for you to send your questions, but because we have just put it up on screen, I'm not sure if we have any questions so far. So I'd like to open for a small break for questions or comments from people in the audience. We have any questions for our speakers, any comments for, for anything that was said. Let us, uh, just like in the opening sessions, let's take a few minutes for two people, the quickest ones to raise their hands to comment. So if you please would like to ask you a question or, or make a comment, please do so. And the remaining others can send them over to this the QR code in order to be done at the end where we're going to have 15 minutes for Q&As. Any comments or questions from the, from the people in the audience? We have one there and one over there. Let's start over there because uh, the microphone is closer. There we go and then we can go over there. Good afternoon, good evening. My question is about what Jonathan and our colleague from uh, Argentinian APD. Um, in this geolit geopolitical moment, I'd like to understand how Brazil coming in with the transversal law comes opens an opportunity for the negotiating uh, international um, data flows in our region so we can perhaps uh, negotiate with other economic blocks in the European Union, but how the Latin American can sort of unlock these agendas, even for in terms of being mutually recognized, uh, of being adequate in protection, data protection levels, and even going to these arenas, uh, going together and not uh, separately. So let's grab the second question too. Considering that the second question is very far from the first, let's start. Uh, Beatrice or Jonathan, does anybody want to answer the first question from Bruno? Could you? No, never mind. If the microphone has arrived while I was blabbering about. So let's ask the second question. Good afternoon or good evening. No, it's good afternoon still. I'm Alexandra. I'm talking um, from the RNP data protection network and and this is the academic network of Brazil we have other academic networks that are f uh, offering services for connectivity to internet and technological services in Argentina Uruguay where we have a partnership a very strong contact with these networks and despite this is a distant question geographically, the content is very similar to what Bruno said. From last year, we have been discussing with how or Seri and Seja, which are our sisters to say so, uh, about this cooperation regarding this conformity of data treatment 
according to the local legislations where um, the in, for, for the research data specifically academic research data and in the RNP uh, work that we have been doing we are facing a lot of this uh, cooperation about understanding how to deal with academic data or or projects in the in the research environment Bruno was already uh, gave his point of view but I would like to also ask and to, to mention our interest to approach the regional authorities of data protection to debate the use of personal data to develop scientific studies researches and so on this is an excellent topic for an, a, a session this year so I'll, I'll write down this this proposal I will let anyone who would like to answer answer now would anyone like to reply can I go may I well I would answer Bruno Mexico has not been adequated to the European regulations but Uruguay and Argentina have been adequated uh, the US was adequated but you all know about what happened with the privacy shield and the transatlantic framework on privacy but I think we need to somehow complement these systems to seek out interoperability. The normative convergence is something that is very difficult to achieve. You know, if we think about an international treaty, like thinking about those who signed the recommendations for the use of AI, that this is in the UNESCO and um, 190 something countries signed that if we think about this as an international treaty it's very complicated I don't know if that's ever gonna happen maybe I might not live to see it but what we can do is look at different approaches and compare the standards that's what happens with the adequation system for GDPR in the European Union and with the contractual clauses in the second level after the adequation in the Ibero-American network and considering the 108 convention so we need to seek out some kind of convergence regarding standards to protect the personal data of citizens because this is a global issue it does not respect borders it flows in constant ways and these are global issues so if we think about this principle of technological neutrality this is very relevant because you might not be physically present in a jurisdiction okay I'm speaking about Silicon Valley or Ireland but you have technological presence in these areas and you're dealing with the data of citizens so you know we need to think of the 108 convention of the European Council to Mec for Mexico the US and Canada Mercosur for Latin America we need to think about how to generate interoperability so that the flow of personal data can have some kind of standard that is a bit more linked to reality well I would like to speak from Argentina's perspective we have a trajectory a history that I think is marking our path forward so we have been adequated since 2003 and since 2018 we all went through an evaluation process regarding our adequations this process has not finished yet for about 13 countries of the region but besides this I think this adequation helps us to build this legal security but I think the adequation itself is not enough the legislations the norms and the actions of the governments also need to solve other problems for example vulnerable groups for example 
sensitive issues that have to do with public health care and many, many others that are affected every day by this issue of personal data privacy and protection. So some tools can help us to generate, to create this trajectory, this profile or a style of a regulation that in some way can offer solutions, concrete solutions for the country's citizens. I think in this sense, I believe that in terms of cooperation, Argentina is in dialogues with actors from all different regions and we are seeking out a diversity in our instruments. If we have a robust instrument that allows us to have a high level of protection of the human rights of our inhabitants, of course we will maintain that and we will seek out other instruments that allow us to legislate and administer in other areas of public policies. Excellent questions and very interesting comments as well. I think this shows us that we do in fact need to think about more than one instrument. As Beatrice said, the instruments can be diverse. And I think Bruno's question reminds us that we can think about different kinds of cooperation at different levels. So that's a very interesting point as well. I agree with Luca. I think the region itself geopolitically is very interesting right now and we are in a very interesting regulatory moment as well argentina with this update and brazil with its very recent law and a recent authority as well at this moment that is currently editing and understanding these international transfers so I think at this time, more cooperations can arise. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Marcelo Martinez, who is the head of the Digital Affairs Dis Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So please speak a little bit about Brazil's role and how you see the Itamarachi in this process. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Itamarachi, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. My name is Marcelo Martinez. I am a diplomat. And about five months ago, I became the head of the Digital Affairs Division of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That basically deals with bilateral, regional, and multilateral issues that have to do with digital governance. So I was in Brussels previously where I was in Brazil's mission with the European Union following this subject amongst others. And when I arrived in Brasilia, the protocol when you start a new role is to visit all of our institutions so we can get to know their visions and uh, receive some kind of orientation on our work. So in March, I visited the ANPD and there I got to know Juliana Miller's team we spoke a lot about the subject. I remember that in the beginning of our conversation, I asked her a question and I asked her, what would the ideal international scenario be for the protection of personal data? And I was imagining she would say, oh, a huge international convention based on the GDPRs to resolve all of my problems. And she looked at me and she said, well, it's an interesting idea, but that's not it. Basically, you know, she was very grounded and she told me that their big concern right now and their main intention at this point is cooperation in order to implement what already exists and therefore be able to monitor. So her intention when she seeks out other countries, it's very pragmatic. My proposal of a utopia was uh, faced with her pragmatism. 
And this reminded me of something that happened right before I arrived. I was at the visit of the very powerful Margaret Vestager, who was in Brazil, visiting alongside other European authorities that were visiting our country. And in her conversation with the Minister of Communication, Juscelino Filho, I saw Vestager ask Juscelino basically for Brazil to align itself. Well, she was speaking about digital platforms at that, st at that time and regulating them. But I think this conversation has to do with a more extensive universe. But she was basically saying that Brazil and other countries need to be aligned with the proposals and regulations from Europe so that the big companies can feel really embarrassed, so embarrassed that they feel like they need to follow these regulations. So, so the big techs can feel an embarrassment and in that way they will follow these regulations. And I soon understood that we need to deep digger. And since then, uh, I've been thinking about this conversation about digital convergence, and data protection and there is such an abyss between the narratives that we see in the multilateral forums and the reality the raw reality and today since this morning i've been in touch and i've heard these different talks that have been offered and it was very interesting for me to get to know them i'm not a specialist in this subject like most of you so what can i offer here to you all today I can say that Brazil is going through a moment in the international scenario that is very special and that the international context, on the other hand, is a very unique window regarding digital governance. Why is it special to Brazil? So I might say some things that could be obvious to some of you, but I think when we put everything together, we can see a more precise and a clearer picture. So. We will have now in this semester, well, we have already started our presidency of the Mercosur. We will be occupying this role over the next semester and next year we will be at the presidency of the G20. So from here until 2025, we will also be in the presidency of the IBAS and the BRICS. Of course, this is a moment for us to communicate our global vision and an opportunity. About the agenda that I think interests us all here, which is the Mercosur agenda, and I was going to answer Bruno's question, but anyway, we do have a plan for the Mercosur on a regional level. Yesterday I was at a meeting with the ANPD and uh, we have been consulting different organizations in the region. We have a very, we are thinking about very concrete measures for this area of data protection. The ANPD has presented two demands, two specific demands, and I asked them if I could share them here, and they said yes, because they have been approved by the council. The first one, which is the most important one, is for us to have an instrument, an international instrument, between the Mercosur countries, but also possibly open to other countries of the region to promote the cooperation and these relationships that of course already exist, but to formalize them between these national authorities of data protection. And we think this will be interesting. The second demand, which might be a little bit more surprising, maybe I will let them communicate it. But I was speaking to my Argentine colleague here. We have a bilateral meeting with Argentina in August, speaking about these issues. And in my unit specifically, it's important to say that traditionally, historically, Brazil has been maintaining conversations in the digital area with developed countries, countries from the north. We talked to the European Union, Germany, the US, and surprisingly, for I saw that this kind of talk was not that common with our Latin American neighbors. And this is something we will change throughout the next few years. 
Regarding the multilateral sphere, just very quickly, it's a very interesting moment in New York. We are in this discussion about the global digital initiative that of course today has more questions than answers nobody really understands what's going on in new york but hopefully in the second semester this will become clearer and very soon we have the 20 year anniversary of the wheezes conferences that will probably be involved with a revision process and of course we will be defending everything that we have already achieved but we can see countries want to revise much of this now judging the policy brief that the general secretary Gutierrez has just issued we have a lot of work coming up I don't know if you know this but Gutierrez is an electrical engineer so he has probably been thinking about this subject for a long time and uh, he has a tech envoy a special envoy for technology that has been working with him since last year and they have a lot of plans for this area about the policy brief that he just issued about the uh, global digital conference if you have not read it please do read it because i think it's very interesting to you all i just looked at the words and expressions that appear in this document and AI appears 13 times over 31 pages, connectivity 26, cooperation 47 times, data appears 84 times and it appears even more than the word technology and it only loses to the word digital. So basically it's a document about data. Data is everywhere in this document. And there's a specific sesh section that is focused on data governance. Among other proposals, I would like to say that there is a suggestion to adopt a declaration about de uh, digital rights. There is the suggestion also of the creation of something that they called global data contact, uh, which establishes uh, principles for data governance until 2030. And it also suggests a decade uh, uh, international decade for data so this is a very symbolic agenda and also very concrete hopefully and uh, to finalize i'd like to tell you that everybody that's here gathered today they will be fundamental for the adoption of the positions that the countries are going to take to these international fora and um i think you are fundamental especially because of these narrative clashes, uh, utopic and dystopic narratives, and both are unlikely, needs to be overcome by uh, replaced by s science and, and scientific consensus or uh, investigations or, or research. And these consensus that can uh, impo propel collective action of, of countries in these international forums. And I'd like to finish with a sentence that was very important to me from a Chilean movie that you might not know. Uh, I'd like to recommend it's called Machuca, which is about a pre-revolution Chilean revolution moment and pre-dictatorship where they do an exercise of mixing several c social classes in schools in Santiago and Machuca is put into a room He's an Indian, more poor. He's put in a white kid's uh, room, and there's a moment where he's bullied, obviously, from all the, the classmates, and uh, the teacher asks him something. He's scared. He has a very difficult time answering the question, and then the teacher says very speaks with him very rudely, very loudly, a sentence that I think is very useful to all of us and to all of our countries in these international fora. And uh, this this is a sentence that I kept to myself, which says, you have to he make yourself heard, Machuca. That's what he says. And this is something that I take it to all my international meetings. Thank you. Excellent, Excellent review of all the several initiatives that are in the Brazilian international agenda or global, uh, regional, there are several things and I'm very glad to have uh, this first reveal 
about the ANPD uh, goals, which are coincidentally comp with the work uh, compatible with the work we're doing here, and we're uh, obviously trying to retake the Bra Brazilian leadership of BRICS, not only not for the rotation uh, presidency, but also the value that this group has for the work that we've been doing for the last few years, which is something that we're going to be able to cooperate on for sure. Now I'd like to send, give the floor to Virginia Palu, who uh, is going to bring to us the experience of the second nation, Latin American nation, with the lar longest history in terms of uh, data protection laws and allows us an optimistic uh, overview, but also a critical uh, gaze on what the b limits are of this cooperation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. This is a challenge of being here, almost uh, being last to speak, to bring uh, things that are avoid repeating also, because this is, panel is an example that we are repeating a lot of concepts, which is part of the synergy that we are have come uh, to as uh, Latin American authorities. Just like Luca was saying, Uruguay has a very strong tradition, and I'd like not to repeat everything for cooperating and integrating with uh, other p our, our legal framework as well has followed a little bit of what Argentina has designed and they have been unanimously approved uh, they were accepted by the European Union and now it was connected to everything that implicates uh, adhering to these good practices international standards and create these uh, guarantees of, of the rights we have evolved consistently and I think this is part of a concept that we need to have uh, present there are not laws that could permit we need to be monitoring and adequating and evolving our legal frameworks the European has have done it and the Uruguayan authorities as well because the world has been changing so fast we ha had a law from 2008 which was completely uh, groundbreaking at the time it was extremely modern but we have been able to evolve this following up all of these technological advances that keep coming up so this capacity that we have the authorities to evolve alongside is something that we need to add to key instances of inter integration and upper cooperation especially with data transfer. When we talk about data transfer, we're talking about global services. We're talking about uh, cloud data. We talk about interoperability and an international level, but also from the point of view of uh, economic development, economic growth and innovation. So everything is connected. There's a very key aspect that we have always uh, tried to use in Uruguay, or at least from the, the personal data uh, authority, due to the institutional situation that we are in in terms of a strategy for a, a digital policy for the country is to promote technology and support tra digital transformation and, and foster all of these uh, impulses but also connected to down to earth right within the laws of the trans data transfer and international exchange of data we have been looking at all of the process <coughs> and the what is being adequated and what countries can transfer data. I think that we have a very similar model to the European to try not to allow uh, our data from Uruguayan citizens to countries that don't have fulfilled certain quality criteria. But also we have the opening open mind to analysis on a case by case basis because we need to keep up with the evolution of the countries and the public sector and the private sector in order to evaluate uh, for each case to grant a, a authorization where where the authorization is granted and where it's not 
we also like to second the, the standardized uh, the support to the standardized clauses and to, to give counsel and to help the sectors to where they need to go and help sometimes the small business people that sometimes there are so many small entities that need to sometimes have a, such a big enemy ahead and like they need to know what they're facing but also we need to, to stay in line with proactive responsibility uh, impact uh, evaluations and all of this uh, evaluation that have been incorporated when there is um, international data transfer there has to be an international uh, an impact assessment and not to limit but to, to assure or to give guarantees and reliability to the system because I think that this is something that Uruguay is being part of a lot of the networks that were mentioned before this what we want to achieve is to defend is the institutional solidity and the robustness of our institutions to for the state's role to guarantee the human rights because we are talking about human rights and we're also positioned as an innovative country but we need to have some assurances and i think this is an aspect an aspect that is important to be discussed it's a little bit of what was commented before is not not to look at this topic necessarily only maybe it's of the data protection i think that the personal data protection is inserted into all aspects of our uh, of our lives so one of the things that i i like to think is not only being an, a member i'm director of the inf agent of the agency of the digital governments in uruguay which is the one that that creates the national policies for digital things in the country this is was an institutional design by me and this gives uh, gives data protection comes from uh, in the design and all policies that we are trying to create in the digital transformation of the country. This is not a minor thing because it implicates that from the get go, it's part of our agenda, it's part of our table of discussions. It's not I have to look at this, I have to take a look and see if I fulfill this law. No, it's part of the design of the laws of the international institutional uh, assurances that we can guarantee to the citizens and I think that's fundamental to contemplate how the authorities are sitting at a table discussing when we are defining the digital policies and digital transformation of our countries explicitly not just a control body that's only enforcing and trying to, to restrict uh, information and innovation I think the, the, mov the movement and the motivation for this event is to support this technological evolution, but done as it should be. In 2003 in Rio, casually, uh, it was approved based on several uh, different conferences for the first plan of the regional digital agenda in the Latin American and Caribbean region. It was then in Uruguay presidency now last year it was in 2024 approved so there's gonna be 17 years and we still continue to have the same agenda having several bar barriers and uh, collectively and connectivity and so many infrastructure problems and equity of access which impacts the rights and the access to data and also the possibility of the region uh, to progress because we're talking about corporations because we want to be competitive as a region we want to offer services to the world so protection of personal data is fundamental but we also need to demand that there is a leveling in so many other aspects and we need to be discussing in those tables to to continue in be inserted in this ecosystem of the country so yes cooperate sit at the table and defend the spaces we need we, we have been discussing about uh, artificial intelligence and on all topics but when we talk about artificial intelligence we talk about the institutionality and governance that are in present in different countries we're discussing about this and also there just it's been discussed whether this is, needs to be in the data protection <laughs> competency and i think that uh, ai has so many ma other things more but yes this they have to be at least a part of the pro this this governance 
this institutionality that the country needs to be. They need to be one more player, not a guest. They they need to be a key actor that cannot, uh, without which the the cooperation cannot exist. We need to think about cooperation among us. Uruguay has always been at your disposal uh, for always to ensure reliability and creating a legal framework for us to be able to uh, guarantee these things. We cannot leave any doors open and we're able to work uh, as a team, but also we need to have the potential to get together and cooperate and to integrate in other spaces and other networks that not only in technological but also on a social level because we need to have a lot more effort and incidents as data protection authorities in order to be sitting at the table to help the digital transformation of our societies. I think that's my vision. Thank you. Virginia for your excellent reflections and at the end of your talk yes I, it made me think about AI because when you spoke about innovation and data protection this subject naturally comes to mind and I think you mentioned some interesting points I want to highlight the first one is how innovation is present in such a strong way so we always need to be reinventing ourselves the authorities the interpretation of these laws and legislations otherwise we cannot face this technological innovation so i need a legal innovation a social innovation so we can deal with these challenges that arise every day that is a very important point and without a doubt when we speak about ai of course, we can think about other actors, as you said. We can think about other norms as well, as we have been. Brazil has some regulatory proposals, and Europe has its act, and many others are coming up, as we can see. But what you said reminded me of something, and I want to share this with everyone. Reminded me of how this transformation and how these different systems, the fact that they are now a part of our day-to-day -day more and more, how will this transform data protection and the already consolidated concepts of this right? So personal data, does it make sense for us to only hang on to this concept or are we speaking about a more, about a broader concept when we think about data and AI systems, the collective perspective as well, which is something that has been mentioned more in the academic world, I think these systems will not only support other regulations and authorities, but also innovations within data protection. And I think this is essential for all of us in Latin America because I think in a way, AI, it really highlights all of these challenges that we have already been looking at for some time. So the concentration of power in the hands of a couple of companies, which is another big problem, which is also geopolitical and that is also connected to data. So in a way, I think there are many subjects that this panel, you know, I think uh, other subjects arise as we speak and maybe we need to organize another panel to speak about these other subjects and be able to continue thinking about this cooperation. Thank you so much, Virginia. Now I want to pass the floor to Elsa. Elsa Mine, who is the president, the chair of the Council of the European Convention 108. So Stella is going to speak. All right, we're going to change the order. Sorry about that. I will pass the floor to Stella Aranha. Is she already the sec secretary uh, for digital rights? Yes. 
the special counsel on digital subjects for the Ministry of Justice. Stella, please tell us about the role of the Ministry of Justice in this dialogue about cooperation between institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. I will start by paying my tribute to Professor Danilo, who was with us last year and who will always be with us because really he is a part of the soul of this debate and this dialogue. So I want to continue with what with the comments you just made, you know, when we speak about cooperation and instruments for cooperation, ways to cooperate, and referencing what has been said when we are discussing institutions and this cooperation, we always need to look at one of the most important issues here, which is the global risks that we are subject to. So the evolution of AI, if we don't look at this, with a lot of attention and care and considering the necessary regulations, AI can also become a global risk. And we are speaking about cooperation in Latin America and Europe. And I want to reference the talk that our head of state just gave in Brussels, which is in a space for cooperation between Latin America, the Caribbean and Europe. He spoke about digital issues and he communicated the government's perspective on this. So basically the point here is integrity and I want to mention <coughs> three points here. So we're speaking about information and informational integrity and we're speaking about realities, the perceptions of realities changing, very serious things that are related to information that of course is related to generative AI and other international discussions. So the integrity of the digital space as a safe space as well. We need to think about this different space and laws and enforcement in this space as well, as has been said here. We need to in some way have enforcement and rules in this space, especially regarding the integrity that protects fundamental rights as a whole and specifically data protection. So data protection is a right that protects other rights. And so we're speaking of course about people's privacy and different kinds of data, of course, not only personal data, but we're looking at how this data is used and how the use of this data can violate rights. So we need to think about this when we think about data protection, how these instruments related to data protection is how they really are protecting these other rights and what rights do we need to look at and apply data protection to in a fair manner, in a proportionate manner, this adequate use for society as a whole. So we need to respect these fundamental rights and think about optimizing this to bring benefits to everyone. We need to seek out this balance. That is one of our concerns. The, these instruments, we can't just discuss the instruments themselves. Oh yeah, we speak a lot about the procedures and the contractual clauses, if they are good or bad and other instruments that we speak about, international ones that have to do with adequation decisions. But we need to think about if these instruments today are guaranteeing the protection that we want to have. Are we protecting fundamental rights? Has this been adequated? Are they offering the protection that we need or do we need to advance in these instruments? So this has to do with what Laura just said with AI this gaze that we've had ever since the beginning of data protection, these initial clauses, are they working today for this protection? So that is what I want to mention here. We can only guarantee this integrity in the digital sphere if we have data protection. But this data protection itself, yes, this is a form of protection 
and the instruments we've created in Brazil and around the world, they really need to have an efficient and effective protection. So that is the discussion. We have instruments, but what are they doing? You know, we're, are we just speaking about procedures here and protocols that are not reaching our objectives? I think that's a discussion that we need to have when the president speaks about cooperation in the digital area globally. I think he is sending a message here that basically without a multilateral cooperation and these debates we cannot reach these objectives of having an enforcement and guaranteeing this informational integrity and protecting these fundamental rights so this is really important and uh, i have a couple other points here for this debate of course this is not a simple discussion there are geopolitical issues involved in this so how do we work on this? There are market aspects as well that have to do with econ economic power. What Laura mentioned, how can we discuss this at a national, regional, and global level? So cooperation, of course, it's multi-sectorial. This is a central issue. And it's clear to us that today the model for guaranteeing rights, it's not just between the government and the citizen there are many stakeholders there are companies that need to work within these laws and this needs to be followed by transparency which allows for a kind of social control as well which is important for society and how do we then really implement this in an effective manner and in a proportionate manner. This is very important when we are thinking about cooperation with companies and the participation of civil society. It's a multilateral debate that has to do with multilateral cooperation and a multi-sectorial debate. So we need to engage civil society, companies, and as Beatrice said, this is not this doesn't only have to do with complying with the system we need to build frameworks and these frameworks need to have some kind of government regulation that may be national regional multilateral so that we can have some kind of enforcement in relation to this that is very important and very central as well in this debate when we when uh, it was mentioned this phrase of our general secretary of the un that technology needs to be at the service of humanity we cannot forget that technology itself it does not have a specific direction or path when we speak about technology there are many different directions and there are co corporations that dominate these technologies and are owners of these technologies and of the data when we speak about data governance today these companies have the capacities to do this they have the resources they have access to markets and many of them are monopolies so they are determining these technologies the technology itself does not actually have a defined path this path is defined by those that are developing it that is why this debate about you know for who is this technology being created <coughs> we need to think about this globally and direct technology and not just think that it follows a path or another because of its evolution per se that is not what we are speaking about here and just to finish up i want to emphasize and highlight the commitment of the brazilian government with latin american cooperation we are prioritizing this it was not a priority as my colleague from Itamarachi has just said, it was not a priority previously, but today we really want to prioritize this Latin American debate and uh, we want to develop this regarding data protection. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Stella. I was thinking about this idea of dedicating this conference to cooperation and innovation. This came up because of last year's conference, because we spoke so much about cooperation last year. Over these past few years, we have noticed a lack of cooperation because of the pandemic, the political situation. We really felt a lack of this. So it's great to see that this is coming back now and society is desiring this, the stakeholders, the academic world and the government, which is putting regional cooperation, international cooperation as a priority. It's great to see that. So just to finish up, last but not least, as we say, Elsa Mine, please. Thank you very much. Uh, boa tarde. Estou muito feliz uh, por estar aqui hoje. É um... So much. It's great to be here today in a wonderful event. Thank you so much to Luca and everyone that's organizing this event. Uh, to English. I hope you understood that. I, um, and we have talked about AI in the last few minutes, I think, and I thought about putting AI to use here to further translate uh, my speech, um, but I had some privacy concerns, so I refrained, and I'm even more thankful to the interpreters who have been doing an excellent job during uh, this event. Um, indeed. Um, I sit here before you as the chair of the Convention 108 of the Council of Europe, and I think Convention 108 has been mentioned here already, so I, on behalf members um, who have been there, uh, very esteemed members of Convention 108, with Uruguay, with Mexico, with Argentina. Um, so I think some of you already sort of know what this is about, but I think um, there are also probably a couple of things people thinking here, there are a lot of C's in the titles um, that I just mentioned, but it doesn't really say what this is about. Um, indeed, um, it is a convention, which means it's an international treaty, which means it's a legally, an, a legally binding instrument. And indeed, at this moment, we have about 55 parties and 40 observers. So it's over 95 countries participating in a convention on data protection. And it has been open for signature some 40 years ago. So we had talked about that in Europe, it was starting like 50 years ago, but it's not only in Europe starting it, it was 1981 and it has been an open convention that is not just a European way. Um, it, is, uh, it really was at that time a pioneer because um, there was not a lot of things going on with data protection, it was really developing and it was laying down the nowadays very common principles of data protection, I think, that you need legal basis, uh, quality of data, transparency, very important data subject rights are laid down there, as well as DPAs, the independent role of uh, data protection authorities, that you need to have a redress to actually enforce it. And, and this was already done over 40 years ago and it continues to be this way. And the other thing is what is rather unique from at least the European Union uh, perspective. This is a convention which is dealing with data protection and data processing for all purposes, not just in the commercial area, but it is uh, also for data processing for purposes of national security and national defense. And let's say that is uh, something maybe I'm from a Ministry of Interior in Germany, so uh, I can assure you that <laughs> uh, the concerns of national security are very much in, in our minds, but uh, with the convention it really gives you an instrument to balance the right to privacy which we all enjoy and which is necessary for the enjoyment of other human rights as well, but also the very legitimate interests uh, states have to access data for national security purposes, for national defense purposes. We have talked about that this was like 40 years ago and continuing on, and, and we have talked about in, in our discussions in this conference the how much technology has changed, the amount of data we are using, big data, I, I mean uh, what kind of data we are collecting, just thinking personally about watches we wear, collecting health data, collecting sleep patterns, so we are very much in a very different situation now than uh, 40 years ago, so there was also an 
update on the Convention 108. Pla 108. It has a very <laughs> non-imaginative uh, name, I have to admit. It's just called Convention 108 Plus. Um, but it is uh, indeed something that is equipped to deal with all these new challenges. I heard the question raised today in another panel. Um, it, needs, uh, it is not yet entered into force. Um, it needs 38 ratifications, which is a lot for an international treaty. But the good news is by now we are at 27. There's literally one in a post going to Strasbourg, so it's 28. And so we, I, I can actually say that we expect that it can enter into force next year. So it's becoming very much uh, reality. And with this framework, um, it also regulates transborder transfers, as we have been talking about the last uh, few hours and days, I think. And the thing is, when we talk about transborder uh, transfers, it also means if you have a common framework, it means also free flow of data. So on the EU Context, it means that I have a free flow of data between Germany and Spain, for example, which was not the case uh, decades before, but it also means in the Convention 108 context, if you're all sharing the same standard, there is also free flow of data, which we sometimes forget when we talk about data protection, that we're saying this is just restricting, but it also enables you, if you have the same set of standards, that you can actually exchange freely um, data. Um, the other C is Council of Europe Convention, indeed. Um, that sounds very European. Um, it has it in its name. Um, but um, one has to consider with Council of Europe, it is at its core, it's an international organization whose goal is the respect of fundamental rights and common values. And this is why it was founded directly after the Second World War. Um, but the thing is, because this is the core value, it also has, a, I think, rather unique instrument, which is called an open convention. An open convention means it starts at the Council of Europe, but it's open to any country um, who in the world to accede to it. The only requirement, well, it is not an easy requirement, to be quite honest, and you all know working in data protection, it's not always easy to get everyone to accept that data protection is a good thing, and you need to do all the regulations, legislations for that, but to accede to Convention 108 Plus, you can do that if you fulfill the requirements and data protection that are laid down there. So it is a Council of Europe Convention, but it is also open for everyone, and it is a global standard. Um, I have been tasked with that, and I'm very happy to say this. Um, so what are the advantages about it? Uh, indeed, it is, um, as a concept, it's principle-based. Um, and as we have been discussing it here, everyone has a different kind of legal tradition. We have a legal system, we have, we have tiny bit of differences on how we handle, how we do legislations, how we cooperate. And because the convention is not meant to be a set text, but you can transpose it also, depending on your legal system, um, you can also transpose it to your own legal system and uh, can respect your own traditions. It is technology neutral. We have talked a lot about technology neutrality uh, and that uh, data itself and technology is neutral. It is meant here, it is an open approach that you don't set on fixed uh, technologies, but rather set principles so you can handle future challenges and we believe for the data protection um, uh, area that uh, it is good th to work with these. I also had a look at the uh, the program we had, and I, I also counted, but a different kind of counting, I, I counted at least six panels on artificial intelligence. I, I saw something on health data, on, um, on educational settings, and I, for me, it was very, as this whole conference has been very enriching, and it marks really something, but these are exactly the discussions we are having in Germany or in the European Union. Um, why these are the things we are all facing, and it really is a matter of um, that this is something not that data just stays in Germany, data just stays in Brazil, but is technologies involving and not really caring about borders in between and that we have to deal with this. And um, 
of course I'm sitting here as a chair, so um, I'm very in favor of it, but indeed the idea of Convention 108 is that you have an international treaty where we can set a global standard and facilitate encountering all these challenges. Um, I think also it has, so far, it has rather proven a bridge, bridge to be between continents. Right now, parties to the convention include Argentina, Uruguay, who is also, um, Gonzalo Sosa is also an elected Puro member, where we very much appreciate him. And um, we have Mexico, we have from the Senegal, the vice chair of Convention 108 is from Senegal. We have also Cabo Verde, Morocco. And we also have observers like Brazil who also participate and we very much appreciate and very much uh, welcome all the participation and further dialogue I'm, I'm very sure we will continue to have. Um, speaking of bridges, I was, I just want to very briefly touch on something which has been discussed here a couple of times. Um, indeed, uh, one thing is that it is a global topic. Um, data protection is an enabler of trust. If you want to cooperate, we have to trust each other, and um, data protection is indeed a way to go that way, and Convention 108 Plus can indeed play a role here because it also includes all processing, including national security, which has been from an EU perspective always been a major issue when we talk about data protection and data flows. Um, I, I'm coming to the end, no worries. <laughs> Um, and just wanted to say that Convention 108 Plus indeed also has transfer tools which everyone has been talking about and we, have, we see the Ibero-American network uh, developing a very interesting uh, set of module uh, contractual clauses. I, I, I see all the, the, the different approaches but I think there's also certain convergence and that is one of the transfer tools we can really do that and the Council of Europe also just managed to adopt a new set of contractual clauses in June, which was prepared by an Pablo Palassi as the expert. Um, it was, uh, our rapporteur was from Switzerland, so this is not an EU member uh, state, and it was discussed by representatives around all the world. And I'm very happy that we could adopt the first ones, controller to controller, which are, I'll do a slightly short ad here, available on our website of the Council of Europe. Um, but I think it really is an area of convergence. To conclude and to return to this uh, panel's topic, um, I think Convention 108 Plus is a legal instrument, of course, uh, binding in the area of data protection, but also in itself, as it works, is fostering cooperation for data protection. Uh, at the moment, we have, as I said, 55 parties and 40 observers, but we are also meeting twice a year, and therefore it is a living instrument, I would say a utopia and a practical <laughs> approach, because within the committee, we are using this unique position to, to discuss common challenges from perspectives from Latin America, from Africa, from Europe. And I really think, and I, I, these are lively discussions, and it's very enriching. So we are also producing recommendations, uh, finding some common grounds for new challenges, which is, for example, re recommendations for facial recognition, digital identity, um, data protection and education, and for example, right now we are working on election and the use of biometrics. Um, was also, the convention and has actually an article on how we should all cooperate between data protection to be efficient in our enforcement. Um, so, um, to conclude, uh, fostering cooperation beyond just data, because we all know in today's world right now, data, and as we have been discussing it the whole time, it really is the basis for most interactions. And with a common understanding about the treatment of personal data, more cooperation in matters of trade, in matters of innovation, really is possible. And a common legal instrument for seeing the cooperation with each other and a free flow of data uh, between its members is really maybe a common way forward to which I can only invite you all to. Thank you very much.
Muito obrigado. Então, pa... Considerando que começamos com 10 minutos... Thank you, Elsa. Uh, considering that we ended 10 minutes... Uh, we started 10 minutes earlier... Uh, later, sorry. We can finish 10 minutes later now. So, I have time for two more questions. Uh, randomly selected two questions here. The easier ones, in, uh, coincidentally, to be answered. So, anybody who wants to answer, please feel free to. How can we protect our data facing a technological dominance from the global north and especially with the power of the American big techs who don't seem to respect our legislations this is an easy question right the easiest second one is also how can you s how do you see the role of this cooperation I'm translating from Spanish so please I apologize if I, any mistakes are made how can you see the the role of this cooperation facing the new perspectives of data with AI neural rights and the immersive technologies and human rights how do you see all of these very easy questions I see to be answered in four minutes total minutes you have four minutes so whoever wants to answer please Nelson go ahead no. Well, I don't know if I can answer this question completely because it's huge, but I do have some recommendations and I want to say a couple of things. No data protection authority or any kind of authority can protect all citizens' rights. So us citizens are the main protectors of our rights. So yesterday we were mentioning education, which I think is very important, public policies for education at all levels and at all times regarding this so that we can me be the main protectors of our rights. Authorities make their best effort, but they know that they do not have the capacity to do everything. So when we're speaking about companies that are from other countries, it's more complex. And I think that, first of all, these companies have uh, more power than any head of state from any country because these are not small companies. When I, I worked as the superintendent in the Authority of Data Protection, this superintendency worked with other areas. One of them was had to do with competences. So we were speaking about the main companies in the country. But with data, we're speaking about the main companies in the world. These are huge companies. And an authority might not do enough, might not be able to do enough. That is why I insist that all authorities act and start to ask questions. These companies, many times, what affects them is when they see their reputation is at stake or people's trust in them is at stake at, is at stake i don't know how much this can affect them of course we're speaking about commits commitments that have to do with ethics and data and we need to think about our rights and what we do for our citizens it's just a reflection thank you so much okay great comment thank you so much yes i want to make a comment as Nelson said, this is a huge question, it's hard to answer it. But I want to say that Argentina's bill incorporates extraterritorial aspects. And this has to do with what was just said. I think it's important that those who are responsible for collecting data from Argentine citizens and that are not in Argentina and don't pay Argentine taxes, they need to comply with Argentine law. And this is a key point here. I did not, I was not able to address all of the points of the Argentine bill, but on our website, you can check out our project and the whole process and the comments of all of the actors involved in the project. And Something else more related to the second question. I don't think I can answer it completely either, but we have incorporated the principle of preeminence, which is a principle that states that if we are facing a doubt, we will always favor 
the proprietor of that personal data. And I think this principle favors guaranteeing these rights in their maximum expression. Does anybody else want to say anything? Fantastic. So, first of all, I want to congratulate you all for your patience, for being here at 6.40 p.m. on a Thursday with us. And I want to congratulate our team from FGV, from the CTS, and I especially want to congratulate one person that I think most of you know. And maybe if you don't know this person personally, you know her via email, Julia. Thanks to her, CPDP Latin America 2023 would not have happened without Julia. So thank you to Julia and congratulations to her. She was the most efficient person in the world, at least over the past two months. And congratulations to everyone. I have three announcements to make here. First one, if you want to speak more about AI cybersecurity platforms, tomorrow morning we have a small event to celebrate the 20 years of the CTS on the 12th floor of the building next door. It's a free event. It's open to the public. You can participate. And there will be a free lunch afterwards. So you can participate for the lunch as well. And so we also have a sunny forecast for tomorrow afternoon and we can go out and drink some caipirinhas afterwards. Having said that, I want to thank all of our participants, our sponsors, our supporters. This year was difficult and we were able, I think, to organize an event even better than our previous event. We always have a very high bar and next year we want an even better event. So thank you so much for your comments, your input, your suggestion, your positive or negative criticism. This is all very useful so we can continue improving our event and be more inclusive and interesting for everyone. Thank you.